Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Laila Sandroni, and I'm a staff fellow working with the IAI, the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. And I'm here to moderate this session, uh, the TDO 101 session part two, uh, based on case studies on applying the TD approach. So for starters, I'd like to um, share with everyone the agenda for the session. We'll start with this welcome and a summary of the previous session, the TD 101 part one. And then we'll uh, have the presentations of the case studies we have here with us. Thank you so much for coming. Zimi Muriz and Sarah Schweitzer with uh, Start International. Marsha Lee Valentine with Jawik, Jamaican Women in Coffee, and Nan de Vernal from the University of Quebec in Montreal. Each of them will share insights about their projects in applying the TD approach in a really wide range of geographical uh, territories. So we have uh, a project applied uh, in Africa, another one in the Caribbean, in Jamaica, and Anne Vernal will talk about uh, her work in the Arctic. Uh, after the presentations, we'll have a Q&A session directly from participants uh, to the, the presenters uh, that could last uh, for 30 minutes tops. And then we'll have an open discussion on applying TD uh, based on the main uh, challenges and opportunities offered by applying such an approach. And then we'll have a conclusion. So to start, I'd like to give you a brief summary of session one and the context of this session. So as I was mentioning, this session is part of an initiative that was built through the partnership of the IAI, the Inter-American Institute, for those of you that are not familiar with the Institute, it's a, an intergovernmental organization that brings together 19 countries from across the Americas uh, to support uh, scientific knowledge and capacity building to address global environmental challenges. And the, the IAI, uh, uh, in partnership with the Belmont Forum, uh, made this proposition of bringing to the SRI uh, a TD 101 workshop. Uh, the idea was to bring the basics and foundations of the theoretical aspects and also the applied TD approach to populate the minds of those already working with TD and also introduce this growing body of uh, research and practice uh, to people engaged in uh, generating solutions and innovations to sustainability. Um, so the first session was facilitated by Gabriela Alonso, Lily House Peters and Marshall Lee Valentine, who is gladly also here with us today. Uh, it, and it was on Monday on June 20th and provided participants with an introduction to the concept of transdisciplinarity and a conceptual foundation for doing and applying term TD research with a focus on solution-oriented science for global environmental change. So uh, the participants were invited to engage in conversations and exercises uh, to recognize the key tenets of conducting TD research and to improve the design of equitable, inclusive, and ethic environments for knowledge production, integration, and also application. The key concepts that were uh, explored by the facilitators in the first session included the co-production of knowledge, integration across diverse knowledge and value systems, and the challenge of transforming science to practice and to move from knowledge extension to knowledge application to inform policy making and on the ground action. Uh, by the end of the session, uh, the, the key concepts were illustrated also with the, the case of JAWIC, Jamaican Women in Coffee, 
and uh, the, this on the ground discussion also invited participants to share learnings and perspectives on issues of uh, relativism and how to relate with these diverse stakeholders while addressing the TD approach. So for this session, we have invited these th uh, three wonderful partners. Uh, and before I pass on the floor to them, I would just ask for us to have a general idea of the audience. If you could put in the chat the country that you call home, it might be where you are or maybe uh, where you come from. And also if you are um, doing TD research or applying a TD approach in which specific topic are you working on? It might be climate change, health, biodiversity, food security, or even none. So if you could just say Brazil biodiversity, this would be my, uh, my way of answering to those questions. So if you could just pop in the chat your country and the team that you, uh, that you work on to uh, address a TD approach. Um, so I would like to pass on the floor uh, to Mizimi and Sara to give their presentation. So 15 minutes for your presentation, please, Sara and Mizimi. Great, I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction. We're pleased to be here. Um, let me move this so we can see the full screen today. Um, my name is Sarah Swizer. I'm the Director of Programs at START International and Mazimi will be joining as well. A Program Specialist at START International will be doing a, a dual presentation um, to share different experiences and really provide a snapshot of the fractal program the Future Resilience for African Cities and Lands Initiative. Okay, so as I said, it's the Future Resilience for African Climate Cities and Land. This was a project that had a span of a geographic scope over eight different cities in Southern Africa and had a variety of, of partners that worked on this project. It was initiated in June of 2015, and it was a four-year project um, with a funding extension that went into mid-2021. It was coordinated by the Climate Systems Analysis Group out of University of Cape Town, and it was part of the Future Climate for Africa initiative um, program that was jointly funded by the UK's Development for International Development and the Natural Environment Research Council. So I just wanna provide a few slides to get us kind of immersed of the, the project topic and what this group was beginning to grapple with. So the aim of this project was to advance knowledge about climate change relevant to Southern African cities and to enhance the integration of this knowledge into medium to long-term decision-making associated with each one of those cities. So from the onset of um, proposal writing, it was very clear with grappling with this problem that a transdisciplinary um, approach was going to be necessary to address these complex issues. Um, with that in mind, from the beginning of proposal writing, as well as the initial kickoff meetings, as the researchers and stakeholders began to work on this project, um, from the very beginning, learning was a key aspect that was really discussed um, and went through iterations of what that meant to the team as a whole. So um, the idea of inclusive, participatory, as well as reflexive learning processes to address climate change resilience was one of the key components that the project looked at as far as kind of a general approach of how the team handled uh, moving forward with research in this regard. Um, just thinking through kind of the team participants that were involved, one of the quotes um, throughout the experience is one of the, the team members really, um, you know, the learning approach was key to them. And so what really made an impression was this approach of learning how to learn. 
So constantly the team was, was rethinking the process of what learning really means, the definition of learning, and how as a team coming from different geographic regions and different disciplines, that the team had different understandings and as a whole reshaped their understanding of learning together. So speaking more about the learning approach, um, it was a collaborative project with the aim to co-create, specifically looking at entry points for climate change information into that decision and planning process that happens at the city level within these countries. Um, it was discussed repeatedly, um, this project over the, the five-year um, time frame really constantly went back to a few concepts, one of them being the need to to embrace this idea of humble science. Um, and receptivity was a key one as well. There was um, key learning and working groups that were specifically documented to capturing the learning processes within Fractal as well, looking at, at different scales from the city, the project level, as well as the whole community of Fractal itself um, to figure out how to drive the process of, of learning and how to develop a framework that would um, really in, enhance and foster the transdisciplinary research that this group was beginning to tackle. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I think I'll just add that as, as well within that it was a very iterative and emergent learning process that was, was constantly changing. Um, now, Mazzini, if if you're able to share, um, the next set of this presentation is going to dive into a few key examples of approaches and methods that were specifically used um, to, to help pursue the transdisciplinary research nature of this project. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. And yes, I'm going to zero in on two methods or approaches that were used to engage as well as to bring together the very diverse um, stakeholders in the various cities, those um, eight cities that Sarah referred to. And I'm excited to see that in the audience today, we do have Sean, who was um, quite central on the city side in the city of Durban. So the first approach or method of engagement were these city learning labs and these, were introduced to ensure that there was a sound method around the core production process. And because of that diverse set of uh, stakeholders, it was a process and a way to integrate how to core explore the climate uh, information and or knowledge. Um, as Sarah said, the aim of the project was really to come together and be able to explore how to have relevant climate information that, were, that, that would be usable um, in decision-making processes in these cities. And because of the, diverse, the, the diversity presented um, from the stakeholders coming from different backgrounds, different disciplines, different forms of knowledge, it was necessary to use this uh, learning lab approach in order to come together and begin to explore the challenges that were identified uh, in the cities. So it was really sort of like a deep dive to not only explore, but to unpack uh, the issues. So the way it was done or the way this, the learning labs were designed and co-designed, not just by one particular set of knowledge bearers, was first to identify the issues and then to also rank them. And then again, as I, I said, to co-explore them because of the complexity uh, and the cross-cutting nature of these issues uh, that emerged. Again, as Sarah pointed out that it was an iterative process of constantly learning and so there was this need to um, have space to to be reflective but to also be flexible uh, in the way that uh, these processes and the learning labs were done and again in that there was a lot of core production, not only of solutions, but in some of the tools that were used, the trainings, the capacity uh, building and development, and so many other products um, 
that spoke to these issues. But the next set of engagement I want to talk about in the next uh, slide involved what we called the embedded researcher um, model or method. And embedded researchers were uh, contracted in each of those cities. And these were early career researchers who were mainly contracted at from the university, but these could be coming from the university and then they were embedded or um, in another form of the phrase, they, they were sort of like in turns um, on the other side, because remember these, um, the main drivers or, or, or should I say uh, uh, partners in these cities were local governments and universities. So the idea of the embedded researcher was that they could be embedded in the other organization and they were sort of like the bridge uh, between the two main partners in these cities and they were very integral, they were the ones who um, the four leaders in terms of bringing stakeholders together, um, understanding uh, the different partners and stakeholders and mapping them, and also to ensure that they, in that process, they also had a lot of capacity development uh, are done at personal level, in their careers, in their growth, and also it just in, in learning the transdisciplinary uh, uh, approach. So I have, we have there some of the quotes coming from the embedded researchers. The first one was from uh, Vindhook and now, yes. So uh, this is Cornelia from Vindhook and she says as an embedded researcher, she was coming from a scientific background, but the TD research she was involved in helped her to learn uh, from all disciplines um, such as the local urban governance and social science. And then in the next uh, slide is um, Lulu uh, Van Ruin and on her left side is actually Sean. Um, so she, uh, the quote from Lulu who was in Durban, she was coming from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. She was then embedded within the city or municipality of uh, Durban, Etiquini. And she said, being an embedded researcher demanded tenacity, initiative, perseverance, and all those uh, uh, precious things. So there was a lot of capacity building, but also just an appreciation of the different stakeholders, but also the different forms of knowledge that would come to the table and how um, to design the processes such as learning labs, such that those different forms of knowledge were presented were represented well, but that also there was a lot of voice equity and that no form of knowledge was superior to another. So it was quite a complex uh, process, but again, as Sarah said, there was a lot of learning uh, uh, from our side. So we can go to the next slide as I uh, 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 conclude. I just want to give an example um, as an outcome that came out of these uh, learning processes, the transdisciplinary processes, but it's from the city of Harare. So the city of Harare was engaged in the fractal project since 2016, and a lot of issues were co-identified and explored. But one of the emerging uh, uh, issues that came out was how there were so many different pieces of legislation and policy that had to do with um, with um, uh, managing environment and particularly water in the in, in in the city, and so with the with the complexity that comes with climate change, um, the processes in Harare that that involved fractal, the the huge recommendation was to try and bring together these different processes, these different uh, uh, units, and so the recommendation was for the local government, the city council, to have a climate desk. And so this was taken forward and the two, there were two or three learning labs within Harare that were then dedicated to um, assisting in terms of structuring the climate desk, um, uh, making sure that um, others came together, particularly from the local government to understand what the climate desk was about, but to also to in, in that togetherness, in that transdisciplinary approach uh, um, to also give input in how it would work. So it was about sens sensitization of the principles to do with the local government, and then making sure that the relevant departments in the city and the different stakeholders not only understood 
what the climate desk was about, but they also made uh, an input. Uh, and so in, in, in that manner, there was a lot of buy-in. So what we then did is that each of the departments from the Harare uh, uh, local government then uh, had a focal person. And so this was the approach that was uh, uh, taken. And so it, it kind of integrated and coordinated issues to do with environmental management and climate. And so there was that streamlining that worked very well. And then in the last uh, uh, slide, you find that the climate desk in, in Harare, which had has been put together for uh, over a year now, has really improved the collaboration. Um, and now it, it's very easy to, to work on targets, it's easy to approach the local council in terms of uh, environmental management, climate, resilience, and all these related uh, issues. But not only at that particular level at local governance, but even at the different tiers, um, even at national level in terms of coordination, a lot of the national processes to do with uh, environmental management, uh, uh, climate and climate change, it's, it's very easy now to to collaborate with the city, to plan with the city, to deliver uh, a better and have deliverables. They've actually uh, set a lot of targets and worked on uh, a forward thinking and forward planning around these um, developmental issues. And they have, um, they have contracts within the city that are performance-based. They have also now dedicated budgets uh, towards some of the work. And a lot of these um, uh, came out of the, uh, of the recommendations from Fractal. And what's exciting is that this is against a background. In Harare way, it was mostly reactionary. Um, so the forward thinking has come through and a lot of the learning that came out. So one of the things as I conclude uh, that has come out as an output uh, from the climate disc is actually a, a mapping of wetlands because there was a sticky issue in the city to do with water and water management and flooding and so forth and a zonation and also the protection of these uh, uh, wetlands. So due to time, I'll stop here. Uh, Sarah, you can put... I think the, the, the next slide, but we've talked about uh, all these issues. This slide um, just talks about all the lessons that have come out, but I've mentioned the cross-cutting issues. Uh, I've also mentioned, you know, carrying forward. And I see Sean, they also put a, a comment that we are carrying the legacy and we continue to work with such cities such as Arara in Durban, just leveraging on the work that was done in Fractal and particularly the transdisciplinary uh, process. So thank you uh, very much. I'll hand over uh, to the moderator as we stop here. Thank you so much, Mizimi and Sara. And fortunately, we'll have some more time to discuss the, the challenges and opportunities of, of each project because I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about this last slide. Um, so uh, one sentence that you said just struck me, uh, uh, really, um, it made me think that it's not just about exploring, but unpacking the issues to address different perspectives. So this is a, a quite interesting mode of seeing the, the TD approach uh, to recognize that it's harder, you have to open it a little bit <laughs> wider so you can fit in these different perspectives. So thank you so much for uh, the presentation and the insights. Next, we move on to Marsha Lee Valentine, who will present her work with Jawik and the Jamaican Women in Coffee. Good morning, all. Are we all seeing my screen? Awesome. Yes, perfectly. All right. Good morning again, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Today, I just want to share very quickly the how the Jamaican Women in Coffee has applied transdisciplinarity to our work. And here I've titled our presentation of lifting women in, in the Jamaican coffee industry through application of transdisciplinarity. A little bit about 
the Jamaican Women in Coffee. We are a chapter of the International Women's Coffee Alliance, Jamaica. Since 2019, we are a registered charity and our mission is to just connect women in the coffee industry to recognize their contribution overall and to empower a sustainable and equitable future for them. We are working through this by developing and nurturing a supportive community and using collaboration and a collective strength to improve change within the coffee industry as it is needed at this time. We offer for our members a vehicle for channeling resources to affiliated coffee communities, both locally and globally. We offer a meeting point for women to network and share their experiences and deliberate over issues. And then we also have a platform for women to develop their leadership and entrepreneurial skills. And you'll see how we do that when we go further down. And then eventually we are trying, we're planning to um, develop a market, a channel for women to market their own coffees, as that is very difficult in the Jamaican coffee space. Um, so our team is led by active women in the Jamaican coffee industry. And according to JACRA, women form at least 25% of registered farm in the Blue Mountain region. Um, there's not much information on the high mountain region because that area has reduced production over the last couple of years. So we are not so certain as to how many women there are in the high mountain region at this point in time actively. And that's something that we're also working to find out through our field survey initiative. So as you can see here, our board consists of members from multiple different backgrounds um, who have committed to or purpose of driving the women in our industry. We have coffee distributors, we have geologists, we have lecturers, consultants in climate change and adaptation. We have digital transformation strategists. We have um, social development and also quality and food safety and environmental management professionals. And farmers are also included in our board. Just to note that this board was newly elected and our past board also included farmers, marketers and persons within the coffee industry and in sustainability. And we intentionally decided to select our team because we wanted diverse backgrounds to help to guide our processes. Because we're a charitable organization, it's very difficult to get expertise without funding. So we try to ensure that our expertise within was able to help to guide us for our initial stages. Now, our initial board um, coined five key initiatives that we saw that would tackle the challenges that I'll just lay out a few of them in the Jamaican coffee industry. We have the field survey initiative that will seek to identify these women, know who they are, what their needs are. We have the quality control initiative, which will seek to improve the quality of the coffee. And then we have market access to increase access to the markets once we have better quality coffee. Then we have our sustainability initiatives, which will improve the livelihoods through sustainable farming practices. And then we have leadership initiative, which will build leaders within the community, community so the women have more confidence in going out there and having a word in policy. Now, it will be too much for me to go through the detail in all these initiatives. So we'll just go to our first initiative in which the, our first impact project was developed. So our field survey in initiative was developed based on a problem that Jamaican women in coffee are underserved due to lack of accurate demographic data. And then our solution was to develop an extensive field survey, which was powered by Salesforce, to learn exactly how we are serving the women and how we can help them, and then set benchmarks for quantifiable results. Now, we initially intended on doing 300 to 400 women in the industry. However, funding prevented that. So we decided to do a pilot survey. And we'll go to that in a few. Now, the main industry challenges that we had that coined us trying to push forward to do this pilot survey was that we saw that there were inequalities within the industry with regards to male and female coffee farmers in terms of the amount they got paid, the assistance they got, how well they were able to source the labor for their farms. 
the voice they had in policy, there was a lot of inequality there. We saw that there was a reduction in the quality and quantity of the coffee, not just from the women farmers, but from Jamaica Blue Mountain in general. And then there was a reduced in quality of life due to insufficient income from their coffee because the, the price of the coffee has been dropping significantly over the past few years. Now, we decided to come together as an ascent organization to develop these programs. And to be honest, none of us have never, we have never been engaged in um, fundraising. We're, we, it's our first charitable organization. We're very new to this. So we found it very important to find partnerships for persons to guide us through this initiative. And here we had collaboration with different entities who offered us mentorship. We had um, the Leap Company, we had entrepreneurs across borders who offered, up, offered us mentorship, also got some initial funding from UN Women to explore the international coffee space. We have support from a, a, not a Salesforce consultancy in Jamaica, and then we have our ongoing support from IWCA Global, and we are still in contact with and continue to collaborate with this, these agencies. And of importance, we partnered with the Jamaica, Jamaica Agricultural Commodities, Commodities Regulatory Authority because they are the regulators for coffee within the industry. So it was very important for us to partner with them and to continue with them because they can give us the information we need on farmers and also provide support if we need it in the field. Now, some of our challenges that we face, um, we have a desire to understand the need of all the women in industry. However, we've been able to acquire this funding for the baseline study because most funding agencies now require tangible outputs and value added products. And we have been having difficulty funding the extended field survey. And that is because many people did not fully understand the challenges that the women face because there has been no study of this type before. So there was no baseline to say, this is why we need to do this study because the information does not exist within Jamaica. We were the first to do this study in Jamaica. And then the regulatory body, JACRA, has, they, they, and they still do have conflicted views towards the root causes of the inequalities that exist within the industry. And that is also because no real study has been done. There, was, there has been no collaboration with the farmers on what the reason for these issues are. Now, we decided to execute, execute a pilot survey and this was self-funded. And we met with about 67 women within the industry across the Blue Mountain regions. And we sought to identify the challenges they faced because that was the only way we could give them something that they really needed. What was the what was the support that you needed? What was the area of intervention that we needed to come in on? Um, throughout the survey, women, they, they basically validated what we had as the challenges. They continuously requested the need for resources, information through training and improvement um, in the quality of their coffee in order to receive higher prices. So it confirmed what we initially thought was the issues existing within the industry. And as you can see here, we went into the field, we engaged with these women, we built trust with them. That was very important for us. We wanted them to trust us because within the Jamaican coffee space, the farmers have been shafted many times through cooperatives, through groups, and there we realized there was a lot of distrust within the industry. But we decided to just let them realize that, hey, we're here to serve you. Just tell us what we want and we'll see how best we can help. And we, in, we ensured that we included them in the planning process. We created community leaders to help us to find other women. And then this was, this led to our field survey report, which gave us some startling information. I won't spend too much time on this, but just to note that, um, on average, each woman that we, the women that we interviewed had about 2.5 acres in coffee. And if, and on those 2.5 acres, women were producing about 40 boxes of coffee. And in Jamaica, 40 boxes is about 60 pounds. And based on the price that they're getting for that, 2.5 acres 
based on the amount that they're outputting is very minimal, right? And they have seen a decrease in the production over the last few years. So those issues were very startling. Um, additionally, we had a case where 52% of the women only had secondary level education and the next 29, call it 30% has primary level education. They indicated that their income from coffee is not sufficient and that some of them have never even received training in coffee. It was just learning from experience from what their parents taught them and then trial and error. Now, as I mentioned, we decided to write a proposal for a project. Um, and this is the strengthening the capacity of women coffee farmers in the Jamaican coffee industry. Fortunately, this was funded by the Canadian Fund for Local Initiatives in 2021 based on the justification provided from the evidence collected in the pilot survey. And because we have different regions within the Blue Mountains, we decided to make this a three-part project. And we first executed it in St. Thomas, then we'll execute it in St. Andrew and then Portland because there are different challenges existing within the different regions. Um, and then the different, the dynamics of the communities are very different. And we didn't want, we wanted to have the woman, women receive optimal results from these initiatives that we're offering. We've also, for note, um, received another funding this year to execute phase two of the project in another region. Now, when we got funding for that project, we again went back out into the field before we designed the material, before we decided what we're going to give the farmers, we did another sensitization session. We, we, we got together the potential trainers and we the industry experts and we continued collaboration with the farmers to determine what they want to be trained in and then what material and solutions they would need for productivity, what inputs would they need? And then we went ahead and then we, we developed training material based on information received from the farmers, what do you need? And that helps to build their confidence also and trust in JAWIC because that co-production of knowledge is very important. We wanted to ensure that they had a voice in the development of their solutions. We designed interactive and demonstrative trainings. We were on the farms. These trainings were very practical and applicable to the, to the challenges that the women faced. We, we got experts in agronomy and sustainable coffee production, and they recommended vital farm tools and inputs that were that were needed for the coffee based on the area that we are in. And then we continue to promote networking among the women by involving the different communities um, to, to just express their different views and their share their experiences with each other. And we ensure that JAWIC remain present throughout the entire project within the communities. Now, we had some very wonderful results. We had 35 women farmers engaged in four training workshops, which were practical and relatable. We had soil management, harvesting, pest and disease management, and sustainable farming practices. These women were very heavily engaged and participative in the trainings, and they shared their own experiences and knowledge with the group. And this we will use to improve the training material for the next group of training. We had in-field demonstrations, um, where the agronomists shared their practices and knowledge. We had areas where the farmers were, the agronomists asked the farmers questions and they basically linked science to the practices shared by the farmers to say, this is why you're doing this, or this is why this works for you. And the farmers really appreciated that. We have two women in Jawik um, from that community community who operate as leaders. They are the liaison of the group. They are the ones who will contact the farmers within the community. They are the ones who will attend events. Um, and we had a woman who, um, she attended the a meet and greet session with the Canadian Fund for Local Initiatives from that community. And that was very, very uplifting for her as she shared. We had a video storytelling activity and then we developed a record keeping booklet for the farmers. We issued care packages, which seedlings, spray pans. Um, we also issued fertilizer for the women, which they needed. 
And we also issue certificates of participation to boost the morale of the women. And then we have women now in the community who are now even hosting international research students for assisting them with their farms and sharing and transferring knowledge. We have also went ahead and designed a monitoring and evaluation survey, which will be implemented next month. We will go back to the community and then we'll find out what is the impact of the project that was implemented? How, what's the, as we're assessing the farmer's knowledge, attitude and perception of that project that was implemented and how they value the assistance given so we can again improve as we go forward and ensure that we, we show them that they are, they were, they were included in the process and that their input is valuable. And to wrap up, we are paving the way forward for the coffee industry. We are continuing to employ these TD principles to all our activities. We have received additional funding or we are in the process of receiving additional funding for a larger scale project to replicate this and the research across the Blue Mountain region on a project we've, we've coined Higher Ground that's in partnership with the Coffee Quality Institute in the US. We have a baseline which to work with from the previous board to the new board that will allow for more innovation and development of our, of our strategic objectives and include the, the, the aim is to include farmers as part of our board going forward, allow them to have that voice starting with the JAWIC. And then we are seeing now where the industry stakeholders are now recognizing the need to improve the infrastructure for knowledge transfer related to coffee production um, in throughout the value chain, starting with the farmers because of this information that we've acquired, because of how we have been out in the field, farmers have been given the voice to speak. We have the information in the study. So the industry stakeholders, the regulatory bodies, they're realizing the need for this type of continuity of these programs. All right, so with that, I will wrap up. And we have a farmer there just saying peace. <laughs> So thank you all for listening in. Thank you so much, Marshalee. Um, one sentence that struck me as well from your presentation was uh, like how, how the process of TD builds empowerment for the people involved in the project as well. So it's a process that goes both ends, right? So it improves the quality of the project itself, but it might also, if done in a way that's actually equitable, uh, empower people to recognize their voice in specific arenas and places. So, uh, so mainly when dealing with underrepresented people uh, of some sort, so like the women in the coffee industry, uh, it's really important to recognize the, the other benefits of the, uh, the TD approach as well. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Um, so next we have Dr. Anne de Vernal from the University of Quebec. If you could please yeah. and share your presentation. Yeah, hello, I will try to share my screen properly. Is it okay? It's perfect, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you uh, for giving me this opportunity to share some, uh, uh, some information about the transdisciplinary project that uh, is endorsed by the Belmont Forum that is called Niche Arctic from Nunavik to Iceland, climate, human and culture through time across the coastal subarctic North Atlantic. So we are moving away from the low latitude and the uh, coffee industry and we are going into the Arctic. And uh, this uh, uh, project that started uh, two years ago and uh, will end uh, next uh, year is a transdisciplinary project really on culture, environment interaction uh, in response to climate change. 
with a focus on the subarctic uh, uh, region that are quite particular. So I was asked to prepare a presentation with the three main topics um, to present what is our team. Uh, and I will present what is uh, our focus and working area uh, to uh, uh, discuss uh, what is our uh, work. And I will give you some example. And I will also give uh, some example of the output to the community of uh, our work. So uh, we um, are a transdisciplinary team. Uh, that include 20 uh, uh, researchers, many students from eight countries, uh, some in geoscience, some in, uh, uh, in literature, some uh, in uh, archaeology, some in design. Uh, we all have the same uh, focus, coastal environment, nearshore environment characterized by subarctic climate, which means that, uh, and this map shows uh, 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 um, some peculiarities of the uh, uh, Arctic subarctic environment. The yellow line is the maximum extent of sea ice cover in winter. The whitish area is a concentration of sea ice. This environment, this coastal environment, are characterized by seasonal sea ice, seasonal to perennial sea ice, by very harsh climate, uh, and also by uh, generally poor knowledge of uh, the condition over hundreds or um, uh, thousand years because uh, of the low population density and very late arrival of uh, human being and very, very recent arrival of uh, uh, European that made the instrumental records. So these uh, areas are uh, interesting by their own uh, because they, they are uh, poorly uh, known from an historical point of view. Uh, the uh, project was, was built uh, uh, based on the expertise, experience of the different members of the group and uh, uh, based on the working areas, the places where we are actually, actually doing some uh, field work and uh, some uh, sample collection. And uh, these uh, areas are illustrated here in uh, purple, the Nunavik, the northern Quebec, uh, occupied by Inuit. Uh, the, in green, the Labrador coast, where uh, uh, they are uh, Inuit, but also some Inu, some Indian people. Uh, the Greenland coast uh, that is occupied, that was occupied by Inuit, but also uh, 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 Norse people, and uh, also Iceland. So these are our uh, working areas, which are all characterized by harsh uh, climate condition. So we are uh, uh, working with, uh, on, with the same focus, understanding the climate, environment, uh, human interaction, but uh, from very different perspectives. And uh, uh, with uh, this figure, I'm showing the uh, study site for each of these uh, regions. So the, these are uh, blows, blow up of the uh, working areas. And uh, in blue are the marine sediment course we examine. My specialty is paleoceanography. So I'm looking at marine, at climate change from uh, a marine viewpoints. In the team, we have people that are looking at the terrestrial area. What are the vegetation change? All the uh, environment is changing on land. And we have archaeologists who are looking at the human occupation. And so this figure gives you an idea of the broad scope of the project. Uh, different perspective means also different archive, different way to and different expertise, different way to look at uh, uh, the history of climate. So we are looking at marine course. Uh, we are looking also at uh, Pete, a time series, oh, I'm sorry, a time series from uh, 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 peat bogs at archaeological uh, uh, remains that are illustrated here on that figure, or also at um, archives that are linked to the, uh, directly to human, uh, uh, which include pictorial art and uh, literature. So our uh, uh, teamwork is transdisciplinary. But I must be honest, most of us are first 
disciplinary. The research, the individual research of each of us remains disciplinary, but we put together our knowledge to uh, develop fruitful uh, uh, interaction, exchange, discussion, which lead to interdisciplinary uh, knowledge, the interdisciplinary project to build new knowledge uh, with the different expertise. So we uh, are developing projects that are interdisciplinary. And within the group, there are younger fellows uh, uh, that uh, uh, are developing transdisciplinary approach that are using the knowledge of the different discipline to develop something new. Uh, and uh, I will uh, give you briefly example of the transdisciplinary activities before to provide examples of the output. So we have meetings. We all meet together with our different languages and we uh, and nomenclature, disciplinary and nomenclature. And for example, we met uh, three uh, weeks ago, two weeks ago, and uh, we had the three day meetings, very interesting, dealing with uh, uh, um, paleoclimate data, climate uh, uh, of the past, dealing with uh, ecological record from a human archaeological point of view and um, also paleoclimatic point of view. And uh, we have a day about the cultural perception of climate in Greenland and Labrador. And this is really fascinating outside of my own field, but uh, really fascinating. We uh, are developing, I was mentioning that uh, bringing the knowledge and the expertise of all, we are developing a, a, a transdisciplinary project and we have uh, two uh, projects that have been developed since two years, thanks to uh, this uh, uh, um, Belmont Forum on Davor. Um, we have a, a project that, that uh, uh, will specifically examine the uh, history of uh, uh, the human occupation and uh, uh, climate change. You know, in uh, that part of the world, in the Nordic areas, the human occupation is quite recent. The first uh, migration of um, uh, of human took place uh, not more than 4,500 uh, uh, years ago and uh, um, choose uh, Bering Land Bridge in that area. And uh, so the population spread and th they have been changing their culture a bit. And uh, one, um, uh, we, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to understand uh, their, uh, uh, the development of the population, the uh, habit of the population, the livelihood of the population in relation with climate. And we have a project that was uh, uh, funded uh, in, the, in Labrador, and it is called the Nunatsiavut Coastal Interaction Project, uh, dealing with climate, environment, and Inuit subsistence strategy because in those harsh environments, you may imagine that subsistence is not uh, simple. And uh, we have another uh, project for which we received seed money to develop a, a more uh, comprehensive project uh, that is in Nunavik, where um, I will talk a little bit more about that, uh, where uh, the people, the Inuit people, would like uh, to propose a UNESCO uh, heritage site. Uh, uh, in the near future, and they ask us to help. So uh, in both uh, project, uh, uh, both thematic project, uh, there was one central hypothesis, and this central hypothesis is that sea ice that uh, uh, is seasonal in a subarctic environment, and the productivity related to sea ice, it is a very particular, were determinant for pre-Inuit livelihood. So in that figure, you have a, an illustration of a, a man uh, doing some hunting uh, uh, on sea ice. And uh, uh, below, you have a, a graph showing the time with uh, the history of the uh, human occupation with the culture pre Dorset culture, Dorset culture, uh, the tool Inuit culture. And there is a very important gap uh, about um, 
700 years ago with a very important change of culture and the hypothesis this is related to climate change and to a reorganization of the climate ocean system in that part of the world that made the productivity and the uh, marine mammal for example a very uh, population very different so um, about the transdisciplinary uh, uh, team uh, work uh, beyond the project that are underway that have been developed that are uh, starting uh, there are some real i think integrative uh, uh, transdisciplinary studies i would like to mention and one is uh, from uh, a postdoctoral uh, student a fellow who uh, uh, has approached uh, the concept of winter in Labrador, um, not based on uh, geological archives, geo, uh, uh, on a, a marine coast or uh, pit, but uh, based on uh, um, discursive source. So she uh, has uh, considered using the literature, all what, uh, that was written uh, from the old time about Labrador to extract information about climate and to transfer the, uh, uh, this knowledge to the uh, scientists. So, uh, and this is extremely interesting. So, um, uh, Marie-Michelle Ouellet bernier uh, I'm referring to her work, was supervised uh, by uh, so, uh, a researcher in literature and, and me, a geoscientist. So, and she uh, produced a very uh, uh, marvelous, uh, um, uh, a good uh, monograph, an excellent monograph. And I just took an extract of it. Uh, here in that uh, uh, figure, it is uh, uh, referencing a geologist who made uh, some survey in the early uh, uh, 90s and uh, he, 1900. And uh, one of the first thing he noticed, and this is reported in his uh, logbook, is that uh, the vocabulary of Inuit to uh, define months has nothing to do with our vocabulary. December is the ice forming month with a very specific name, not January. And January is a cold month for frost. And uh, this is something very interesting because we start the transdisciplinary uh, work, start with vocabulary that have nothing to do. And it is very important to be able to understand each other. And this is something that uh, uh, came out from uh, uh, the work of Marie Michel. By the way, snow, we know the word snow, that is white and that is uh, nice. But for the Inuit people, there are 42 words to define snow because snow can be very different depending upon uh, climate condition. So I think this, is a, an, um, this was a good example of transdisciplinary study. So now uh, I would like to show briefly three examples of the output to the community in a very large sense. One of the examples I would like to uh, provide is, uh, 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 comes from publication of historical and, uh, uh, um, and literacy perspective, which include uh, poetry about the Arctic and the specificity of the North sea ice, cold, remote, dark, you may uh, imagine all those were contrasted. And here are three uh, examples of books that were published in uh, within the past few months. One is dealing with uh, the uh, Norwegian uh, uh, literature about the Arctic uh, that uh, provide a, a very um, different perspective, the perspective of the people uh, concerning the climate in the Arctic, and uh, this was translated from the Norwegian to French. Uh, the other book I would like to refer to is uh, Darkness. This book was uh, uh, published, if you, this book is uh, 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 available on PDF. As PDF, it is free. So it is really uh, 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 open to a very, very large public. And uh, you will find extract uh, there in Icelandic 
in French, in English, and in many other languages. So this transdisciplinarity is also multilingual. And the third example I'm uh, referring to, Note de Terrain pour la Tundra Alpine, is in French. It is poetry that describe the Arctic processes. So uh, this is an example of output to the community because this is for the community and is this publicly available. Another output uh, uh, is a um, workshop concerned what deals with workshop and exchange with young people in school about climate change in coastal subarctic environment. Um, in the past year, uh, some students of our group have developed some uh, uh, booklet workshop with some very simple explanation of climate change through time and with some exercise and they are visiting school. And this booklet will be uh, soon uh, uh, available for uh, uh, the teacher trainers. And it is quite uh, interesting because because uh, it is a way to start a sort of a dialogue about climate with the young generation, uh, which will uh, experience very large climate change in their uh, environment. And uh, we are just starting now, based on this, we are just starting a new project that was supported by uh, 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 the Research Fund of Quebec, and uh, that is called Face to Face for Climate Dialogue about a hot topic that can give you chills. It is about warming, global warming, and uh, the consequence of the global warming. And in that uh, project, we um, are uh, first, the first step is to interview teenagers to visit school and to exchange with the uh, young and to um, and this is uh, approximately done. We have uh, close to 200 uh, uh, results of interview with teenagers. And from this, we will uh, identify what are the critical topics for them, for the young fellow. And when we will uh, have identified the critical topic by the end of the summer, we will uh, start uh, preparing answers as triptych uh, uh, with the uh, answer from scientists, so the facts, what is, uh, what, uh, what is a reality to answer the question, uh, with communicator for the large audience and with artists to see what is a perception. And uh, with that triptych, we plan to have an itinerary, itinerary exposition in the forthcoming year. So uh, the last example I would like to, uh, uh, to mention is uh, for which uh, we have started to, uh, to work is uh, the development of a future UNESCO World Heritage Site. In the northern uh, Nunavik, there are very unique uh, uh, petroglyphs and heritage is an illustration of petroglyph. So uh, figures that uh, were uh, made by uh, thousands of years ago by, uh, uh, by population. And uh, the community, the modern Inuit community would like to uh, valorize uh, their culture, their history, and uh, they would like to uh, propose uh, the high Artalic site as a future, as a UNESCO heritage site. And uh, to prepare the, uh, uh, the proposal, they need the context, a climatic context. And uh, they have asked us uh, to uh, help them to prepare that uh, paleo climate, paleo environmental context uh, to explain in which types of uh, condition the human uh, 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 occupied uh, the region, the area. So, uh, and this is a, a joint venture with the people from the Avatar Cultural Institute uh, mandated by the communities. So I will finish with that. Uh, this is another overview of our project uh, showing the places where are the researchers, uh, 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 red uh, dots, and uh, the working area, and uh, the logos of the institutes involved, the academic and non-academic institute involved in the project. Thank you. Thank you so much, and for this really, really interesting. And I echo the comments on the chat box about how interesting it is 
to take an overview of the TD approach applied to such different uh, territorial contexts. And it really struck me in your presentation also the importance of local categories to understand the local perspective, right? So uh, when scientists that are trying to apply a TD project come with a, a two fixed set of categories to look at the world and do not relate to the ones that are already present in the people that live in that environment, it's really hard to open the issues in a way that's really possible to encompass this, these diverse perspectives. So thank you so much for the uh, showing how the, the local community looks at the time passing throughout the year. That was really, really interesting. Thank you so much. So at this point, uh, I'd like to open the floor to, to the participants uh, to have direct questions to each of the presenters or to all of them, as you wish. I have loads of questions in my mind, but I really like to give <laughs> uh, the opportunity for those that um, uh, could come to this session so they can address directly our participants. I think while they everyone collects their thoughts, Lila, why don't you start with one of the present questions because I can almost feel them coming out of you. Yeah, <laughs> so. Well, yeah, one question that was uh, running through my mind while was, I was taking a look at all the, uh, the presentations uh, was about, on one hand, the, the idea of different uh, funding mechanisms and how they can relate to specific aspects of the, the TD approach. Uh, so in each of the presentations, you could see that the project had uh, the um, specific aspects that they could cover really well due to the funding mechanism that was uh, behind the whole process and the other ones that it was a little bit more difficult to relate to. So uh, I was wondering if the, the, all, the all, all three of you, all four of you actually, could comment a little bit on the challenges and opportunities that were uh, found throughout your projects due to funding possibilities and also contingencies. If we could start the other way around, start with them and end up with Mizimi and Sara. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that important question. So. Of course, Fractal was a project that emanated out of um, a proposal. And, and so, you know, there were limitations in terms of some of the, the issues or the focus that, that we could uh, look at. But we were very fortunate. I mean, transdisciplinary processes take time, they take effort, and they definitely uh, uh, need funding and a bit of consistency in those three things. But we were fortunate that in a lot of the cities, um, they had four, five, six years working on the same projects with the same uh, kind of stakeholders and partners. So that helped um, in terms of sustainability and continuity. And so that's why we're talking about legacy uh, processes. But I just want to also say that we also managed to have a little bit of a pushback in terms of um, making sure that we could be flexible and you know, taking time to explain that to our funding partners, but also having this as, as one of the, the outcomes to push that flexibility, because as we were saying, there were so many uh, things that we learned and we could have done and we could do better. So, but it has also opened up um, opportunities to continue the work and there were a lot, there were, there were lots of interests generated along the way, which has also helped kind of bringing in on board more people to work on those processes and to continue the work. Thank you. I would just add to onto Mazzini's remarks, the Future Climate for Africa program. I think once we got started and they saw how keen people were to 
have transdisciplinary case studies that they really reoriented and let us let the group focus on learning quite substantially. So Fractal has several outputs and um, podcasts and series that are centrally located around the learning that took place within the research community of Fractal, um, which would be something that we could could share in the in the SRI chat box for people to check out as resources. Thank you. Marshall, please. Sure. So just to point out one of the main things for us, because we were an ascent organization, as I mentioned earlier, we were all new to fundraising and community, rural community development. Um, I think myself and Anne were probably myself, Anne and Janelle, who's another PhD student, um, were the only three board members that have had interactions with the community. And when we started writing projects, it was, I think the issue for us receiving funds was the fact that this baseline study had never been done. So funders were uncertain as to how it would impact the community. So there was hesitancy in relation to how the funds would be used. So we constantly got pushed back with our proposal, proposals on how it would impact. So we needed to continue to improve our internal proposal writing skills and also include, because we, I think it's safe to say, I think Anne is also here. Hi, Anne. She's our vice president. She, I think it's safe to say that we also had no idea how to write TD into our projects. And I think once we learned how to do that and provide justifications, it made it a lot easier. And that's why it was so important for us to get all the information from the community. That was why it was, was important for us to do that baseline study, because at least now we have that information to write our projects with. And with our first impact project, we're realizing now that more agencies are interested in funding our initiatives. They're seeing that there's impact. They're seeing that you know, there are opportunities there for improvement in the livelihoods of these women. But I think the initial challenge for us was understanding how to write um, the approach into our projects. And also the second thing was the industry not understanding what the outputs would be because there has been no study of that sort and of that magnitude within the Jamaican coffee industry space before. Thank you so much. And the, so just before and I don't know if Anne Teresa that's also here, she's also here, she would like to comment on that as well. <laughs> so you would like to know about the funding path? Yes. Uh, what kinds of constraints and possibilities your project had? due to the funding mechanisms that supported it. There are special calls for transdisciplinary research that mm -hmm. fosters us to go toward transdisciplinarity. Because this is not something that is natural in science. In natural science, we are very busy by maintaining the lab and trying to find the fund to, to do the, our basic research. So uh, uh, without specific funds for doing transdisciplinarity, this would be impossible almost impossible. And uh, I must say that in the um, thanks to the Belmont Forum, this is one of those initiatives that uh, uh, really uh, op opens the opportunity for uh, uh, seeking uh, funds to start project and uh, transdisciplinary project. But um, in Canada and uh, mostly in the Quebec province, there are uh, a specific envelope of money for transdisciplinarity and for communication across uh, the different disciplines. And I think this is, uh, this comes from the top, but uh, I think it is fruitful in our case, uh, at least. Maybe Natasha would have something uh, to add about that point. Natasha is the coordinator of, uh, uh, she's here of uh, Niche Arctic. Uh, hi, everyone. Natasha. Yeah. Hi, everyone. No, I think uh, I'm agree with Anne and she made the wrong. 
the realm of the question. It's quite a bit difficult to get some funding from transdisciplinary or to just to increase the output for a community. And, uh, but we try to do our best to just increase that and make it more relevant for community because community don't just want to see science in comic and living. They want to have uh, more information about, about the, the following of the project. So this mm -hmm. part, it's quite hard to, to focus on. Mm -hmm. So the con colonialist approach is uh, uh, is over. <laughs> we uh, we are uh, responding to the need of the communities. This is what we try to do. Marshali, did you want to comment something else before I pass on the word to Fanny? Yes. So I was about to say that. Um, it's very difficult. I think uh, Natasha mentioned something similar. It's very difficult um, for funders to, some, to sometimes see the value of um, some of the intentions of our projects. So getting that baseline data, transfer of knowledge. Um, we wrote a project that was strictly knowledge-based, just capacity building. That was the higher ground project. And the funding agency basically came back to us and say, hey, we need you to give them things, <laughs> give them, give them chemicals, give them fertilizer, give them something. We need tangible results. We don't think the, the knowledge transfer is important, but we're saying, hey, that's the root of the issue. We've realized based on our study that that is the root of our issue in the industry. We've spoken to the farmers, we've spoken to the industry players, and this is the main issue. Why would we spend millions on buying fertilizer if the farmer does not know how to use it. So that's some conflict that we constantly have. I mean, we needed the, the funding and we've tried to work our way around how we could do that without taking away from the capacity building. So we kind of rewrote the project to include us giving them something because I guess the agency needs, when, they, when the project wraps up, they need to take some pictures to say, hey, we gave the farmers this. <laughs> And that is a big challenge that we have. They need to see tangible things. And from our, our objective is to build, uplift the industry through building that knowledge, having the farmers know so they can execute. So that, that was something that I think I needed to point out. Thank you so much. Yeah, and the tangible stuff can, cannot be a certificate, right? <laughs> Exactly. Uh, so I'd like to pass the word first to Fanny Ramos Quispe and then to Pauline. Fanny, please. Thank you, Laila. Oh, maybe Antares wanted to talk before, uh, I think. Oh, she just said that materials coupled with knowledge to please funders. Yeah, she's basically saying what I said they need. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly as Marshall was saying. Um, another thing I'll just add, I'm sorry, I don't have video right now, but um, just to add that with the pilot study, uh, it was actually self-funded, right? Because um, at the time we couldn't get funding from you know, other grant agencies. So we saw the value, we saw the need. Um, so we actually put up our own funding, going to our own pockets to self-finance um, this project. And it was from that pilot study, you know, that we could use the results from those pilot study to really venture off into applying for the CFLI grant and for it to become the success that it was. Thank you so much, and Teresa. Okay, Fine. thank you, Lena. And thank you uh, all the speakers because the, your projects and your examples are just very interesting. So many ideas came to my mind while you were talking. And while thinking about transdisciplinary science and your experiences on co-production of documents. Um, I had this, this question or I, I was wondering how do you think and what do you think and how did you deal with 
the production of different types of documents because um, I think in most, well, some countries, including mine especially, um, there is a difference between scientific documents and other literature, right? And mainly the documents that are produced by NGOs, organizations, whichever are not universities, are not really considered as scientific uh, literature, are something else, gray or whatever name uh, society want to give them. So uh, by in this um, way of building transdisciplinary science, uh, how are you dealing with that? Or did you have some constraints about using or producing different types of, of documents while, for example, Marshall, uh, you were producing these uh, um, great uh, guides uh, with, uh, with women and you use also the, those guidelines for them to continue these trainings um, did you have any limitation with funding or other organizations to see these documents as scientific as well? Uh, yeah, I would like to hear your comments and all of yeah, yes. all of you. <laughs> Thank you. So I can go first. Um, so that's a very important question, very interesting question too, um, because it's something I struggled with in us designing the training material because the idea is for us, us to have a repository of information for the farmers. However, we need that information, yes, to be applicable to what they're doing, but to also have some scientific basis. Um, what we did when we were developing the training material, um, so firstly, the presentations, we requested the agronomists themselves to and the coffee industry stakeholders who the the, the soil, soil quality professional who did that presentation, he worked with the Jamaica's largest fertilizer company. So he is he, he's a scientist and a professional in, in his area. So we asked him to design that material, then we reviewed it internally. Um, what we got from the farmers, what information specifically they'd like, and then we asked them to design material based on that. For the the harvesting and pest management, luckily for us, the individual who delivered that training used to be an employee at JACRA, the Jamaica Agricultural Commodities Regulatory Authority. They are the regulators for coffee in Jamaica. And they have a booklet with which they've published and it's very public. So we were able to pull information from that, of course, it reference to them to deliver that information to the farmers. And of course, we also relied on, for that record keeping book, I'm a quality management systems um, consultant by profession. So I design procedures, instructions, forms, all of that. So I use my expertise to pull information from other reputable sources to put in that icon booklet along with the information from the experts. Now, while that, may, while that booklet may not be a published um, booklet, it was applicable for the purpose that we wanted it to. It replicated in summary the information that we needed to deliver to the farmers in summary, plus we created a method for them to document how much fertilizer they're using, how much chemicals they're using, where, um, what season they're cleaning their, like how much are they doing crop care, soil care. So it's just um, us making sure that the information that we put out there is not too technical, but applicable. Um, but I guess going forward, the challenge would be to ensure that if we put our stamp on something, we'll have to just ensure that that's valid information going to the farmers. And we, we wanted to ensure that that is what we did for our first project. So we ensure that we pulled all our expertise together to make sure that that information is in fact valid information for them to use. And so again, we didn't, we didn't really get additional funding for that, or we just ensure that we pull all our resources together um, just to make sure that they get value for the funding money. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Marshalee. Saram, Zimi, Oran, do you want to comment on that? 
Let me comment yeah. on the publication, if you uh, wish. Uh, as researcher, we have to publish in the peer-reviewed journal. This is clear. But uh, if we want to establish dialogue with the people, we have to publish things that they and the people will understand. So I think that all sorts of publications are uh, uh, are valid. And for example, uh, in our group, they are uh, trying to make comics to explain climate change. And so in order to reach uh, the young people, the teenager, they, and these are parts of the community. So um, uh, I, I think that everything is important. Now I am spoiled. I have the chance to be in Canada, in Quebec, where we have research center that uh, understands the importance of it. And uh, when we are ready to publish the comic books that uh, we are preparing with students, we will go to the university, to my research center, to several places to find the money to make the publication. So I know that, uh, I, but, uh, but I think it is important to diversify the way to communicate the information. Thank you. Zime? Uh, yes. Uh, so in Fractal, we had about 30 uh, partners because in each of those cities, there was a local government partner and a university partner. And then those that were external um, or even internal uh, partners in those cities. And that diversity then gave us um, different target groups. So researchers and academics were able to work on academic outputs such as you know, research papers and so forth. And there was an appetite for it because we also had students and early career researchers and you know, working on their thesis and things like that. But with then we also had the different uh, types of, of stakeholders and knowledge uh, bearers. And you find that we really tried to be creative with the Red Cross Crescent, for example, and they led us very well in things like facilitation tools, uh, looking at um, drama and creative arts. There was a youth group in the city of Lusaka, for example, uh, and, and you know they they demonstrated or, or talked about their perspectives using drama and art and, and so forth and so on. And then we had um, other stakeholders like ICLI who developed these Talanoa dialogues and infographics. And, and, and then we had um, the Stockholm Environmental Institute, for example, uh, they developed tools around transformative uh, leadership around how to rank um, uh, issues, for example. And I think what, what it then did is it put a lot of us on the spot uh, to, to develop uh, in, in communication skills and also developing these communication products outside of our traditional products that we knew. So for example, you know, there was a lot of demand on the PIs to work on online articles they were coming from the research fraternity and it was something new, but it developed uh, all of us capacities, short videos, uh, pictures and so forth. And Sarah and I, of course, have shared the links uh, and, and all of us are well, I mean, all of you are welcome to look at some of those outputs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sarah? Yeah, I just wanted to add a quick reflection of thinking of the initial question that you asked about funding mechanisms and what structures are in place and, and conflict or obstacles that could be um, arise from that, as well as thinking about this question about publications and, and different ways um, that things need to be produced. It, it, I think it's very front and center of, of transdisciplinary methods and research that is conducted, but everyone that is involved and wants to be involved, I think soon, you know, really grapples with the fact that you have to be ready to be uncomfortable, that that's, that's kind of at some point during the situation of interacting in a transdisciplinary process that you may be vulnerable or that you may be in a setting where you're talking about something and sharing experiences that you really feel like you know nothing about. Um, so one of, you know, just to add on to Mazzini's comments, um, SEI, one of our partners, they created a game called Spill the Beans that was really about trying to 
create a dialogue where people felt comfortable to share and to come to the table. And it was around um, various ways of understanding resilience. So climate resilience in the context of these eight different cities in, in Southern Africa, um, but really being able to interrogate and share different ways of understanding the concept of resilience. And so as a, a result of being able to break down some of those conversations, thinking about the different types of products and publications that are produced, SEI then developed um, kind of a one pager that outlines how you might be able to take that game into a different context and apply it into a different TD research setting. So there's several products that were developed too that speak to kind of these, you know, various names, but whether you're a coordinator in a TD project or you're sitting in that kind of boundary space of trying to glue all of these different researchers and stakeholders and that have very diverse perspectives and maybe different roles within the project, um, but just kind of key products that fit different needs as well. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so uh, please, Pauline, you, want, you wanted to make a question to our panelists. Yeah, uh, thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. I really enjoyed uh, this session, quite uh, diverse uh, and uh, quite uh, transdisciplinary. Uh, my question is really for Michelle. Uh, so you, uh, you you mentioned uh, that you uh, targeted uh, these women uh, because uh, I guess uh, you realized that they are disadvantaged uh, uh, compared to their male counterparts. Um, but uh, I also assume that uh, the male counterparts um, have some things that, that are working, that they are doing. Uh, what models have you put in place uh, to uh, make sure that there's cross-learning from uh, the um, aspects that the male counterparts are doing uh, so that the, the females can also do that uh, for them to be successful, taking into consideration the barriers that you identified uh, during the pilot survey? A good question. Thank you, Pauline. So Thank after you, you Marshallie, maybe Aunt Teresa can make a comment as well, because she had her hand raised. Yes. She can so, comment on both. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question. Very important and interesting question. Um, so even though we are Jamaican women in coffee, um, we've, <laughs> we've made it um, clear that, I mean, we are representing the women in the coffee industry. However, we have not neglected the fact that the men exist there and that there are some practices that we need to cross transfer. So the issues that we're having with the, the inequality between men and women is not necessarily because the men are doing anything different. It's just that they're seen more as the powerhouses within the coffee space. It's a male dominated industry. Um, so we have many of these women they, their husbands are also coffee farmers, right? Um, so what we've encouraged is that when you learn from us, you go back and transfer that knowledge. And I mean, we've had, a, had instances where men have asked, can we also be a part of your organization? And we said, yes, you can be. However, of course, women will get preference. So we are, we are not really turning anyone back. We're ensuring that the information that we acquire is of best practices pulled from, as you mentioned, what the, the male counterparts are doing differently. There are some things that the women, for example, our terrain is treacherous. Um, so for the average woman, like I always use my hand as an example, like this is the hillside in Jamaica for coffee. So you literally have people planting coffee on this slope. <laughs> so imagine um, a woman with a child you know, going up that slope. And trust me, I've seen women with their children harvesting coffee and those little children are there. Um, so they don't have enough time to pay attention to detail as much as the man does because she has more household responsibilities. So it's challenges that, that we've identified. The crop care, the harvesting, some of those, they, they are across the industry for both men and women. However, we've tried, we're trying to focus on the women because they are the ones who are underrepresented. When the coffee industry or Jakra at this moment goes into the field, they're mostly going to the male farmers. 
We've had women who said they've never seen the regulators at their farm any at all. So they are underrepresented. So we are trying to represent them in a way they've never been represented. And we are also opening up our knowledge distribution to the male counterparts because the men are sometimes who help us to, you know, lift those fertilizer bags. I've had a man, a male, a farmer, um, assist me with driving up those hills. I've never met him before. My car was stuck and he had to come in my car, drive me to the location. All right, so we do have um, men helping us throughout and we are not saying that we're not a male-centered organization. We're just focusing heavily on the women, but we do that knowledge transfer where necessary. So the infrastructure we have in place is just to encourage the women to transfer that knowledge to their male counterparts and also looking where there are, there are the the malpractices that the, the practice that the men are implemented that women aren't if there's any way we can improve that so the women can implement then we try to implement those practices in a creative way so that they can do better That's anyone thank you and teresa yeah you want i was to just gonna i was gonna support um just what marshall is compliment what marshall is saying um initially i had my hand raised about fanny's question uh, with the publications um, I completely agree with Anne, um, the other Anne, <laughs> where, um, where all publications, in my opinion, are very, very valid. And for JAWIC, um, or pilot survey, um, you know, that is really a technical report, right? And that report was actually um, given to to one of the, the ministers in the in the industry, agriculture minister in the industry, um, because generally these sectors, they, they generally focus on the technical reports, right? Not the heavily jargon academic um, papers, which do have their place definitely. Um, and that is why for our upcoming research, where we are hoping that we can get funding to do a industry-wide um, baseline research um, that is scientifically robust because we want to do both a technical report for our policymakers as well as um, you know the academic peer reviewed journal published um, you know scientific papers. So you know the, there has to be a balance. Not not everything can be completely academic because you have to cater to a wider. Um, community, a wider audience. We have to cater to our farmers. We have to cater to policymakers. We have to cater, you know, to the academics who may be interested in doing more research within the area. And currently, there's no gender gap research in the area. There's no gender analysis um, being done within Jamaica's coffee industry. So that is a gap that Jawick wants to fill. Um, but it does it does take funding, and that's what we're working on to do. Yeah. Thank you so much, and Teresa. So uh, at this point, I would pass on to the last part of our workshop here. And I really like to seize the opportunity of having this wonderful audience and this wonderful panelists together here. Uh, so, uh, so many people experienced in, in TD practice and research uh, working on different issues on water, food security, climate change, fisheries, Tindi in general, education, climate and health. So I, I'd really like to seize this opportunity um, to gather the information and the experiences of all those people. So uh, you are all invited uh, to go to the Jamboard in the link that I just put in the chat and provide any insights on the questions that are there. I'm going to share my screen so we can also take a look of what comes out of it while we populate it. So our panelists are also really invited to uh, contribute as you see it fit. So, uh, 
I think most of you are, are probably familiar with jam boards as well, but you uh, the most popular uh, functions of it are this one, the sticky notes. So just click here and add a sticky note to whatever you want to say, or you can also add an image or a photograph. You can Google it, upload it from your computer uh, to uh, recognize something that you might imagine can relate to the question. So uh, the first idea here would be, so you're saying you're seeing the second slide, but what are the common sources of conflict or controversy in TD projects? So in your experience, uh, what were the main challenges of trying to apply TD? So uh, I could offer some examples, but I, I'd love to see what comes up with the audience and we can comment a little bit on it. I can't write anything because you, otherwise you will see <laughs> that I am writing it. So these are, are already three really interesting topics for our conversation. So as we addressed a little bit, the idea of equity in budgets among different partners or, or different funding priorities, um, would the person that, won, uh, that shared the idea of miscommunication between different stakeholder groups would care to comment a little bit how this miscommunication occurs and why? That was me. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> what I have experienced or at least seen definitely happen is, is that there's just not the same language. And I don't mean the same language as in English or French or, or, or Spanish or any of those, those pieces, although definitely that can be part of, of the challenge, um, which actually a few people on this call will have heard me complain about before too, because I do think sharing, being able to speak between languages is important, but also just even within the groups that are doing the research, understanding and creating a shared language um, around what we're trying to achieve. Different words mean different things in different contexts with different, you know, even between different countries or even within the same community, but different between different types of stakeholders. And so making sure that you set the groundwork and you create that space for common communication, I think is super important. It's very easy for miscommunication between stakeholder groups um, to arise um, from, from very small, surprising sources. It can be as simple as a, a different um, definition for a shared word that's used in, a, in the same context. So you write a sentence, the other person is like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I mean. But you don't realize that that person is reading one of those words very differently um, until it becomes a real big problem, which I have seen recently. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that comment. Another issue that has been uh, being um, treated here, and, and I think that we didn't really cover that much while we were talking about funding priorities and uh, the different uh, mechanisms of funding is that the academic incentives versus uh, timelines or perspectives of stakeholders or lack of funding for a specific parties or stakeholders. So, uh, and this is, um, if I, may also comment a little bit is also a really hard part of of the the projects because you have really um sensitive ethical issues related to compensating financially the people that are working in the project from the communities right 
so if they are working directly in the project, of course, they should be compensated for their work. But also if they are engaged in, in other roles or just like in, in terms of uh, knowledge sharing, it might be also sensitive inside the communities to remunerate some specific people and not others. So this is a really uh, complex situation. And uh, does anyone else that uh, provided that insight want to comment on that? I don't see hands raised. Well, Lila, I made that comment talking about the incentives and the timelines. I mean, I think most of us who have been in academia know that the time from beginning a study to producing an academic paper is often very long and is not aligned with the needs of local partners who said, hey, you did that study, you know, six months ago, a year ago, two years ago. Why don't we have anything? There's not even, you know, a brief a policy document or something. And, and so there are different pressures, timelines, and expectations. And I thought the group did a great job talking about the kinds of products <laughs> that, that come out of, of TD research. But at the end of the day, most of my colleagues in academia are evaluated by the journals they publish in, the impact factor, Wedemads and Scopus, and they don't receive credit in their academic promotion and tenure and evaluation for non-academic products. Uh, and that's that's true, certainly in, in most universities in Latin America and in many places in North America, I'll, I'll say from my experience. Thank you so much, Anna. I completely agree with that because uh, it's a delicate balance because everyone has uh, its own specific interests and we have to be honest about our, our own as well. The institution that we represent, if we are academics or working with an NGO or working in an intergovernmental organization, we have our own agenda as well that has to be fulfilled somehow. And uh, uh, I think a good, so uh, I'll start to go on to, to the next slide before we get there, but the best opportunity for it is to be as honest as possible about all those agendas and try to negotiate them in the most equitable way possible as well. Uh, so managing expectations across the partners, that's also a big issue that relates to the one that we are talking about. Does the person that put just put up this sticky note wants to comment on it? What was on their minds? Uh, yes, so that was me. I, I think it's, very relatable to what has been said before in, in terms of different agendas, uh, even power dynamics and just managing that. And often you find that there are a lot of tensions, uh, perhaps not expressed. And so things might not move on as, as much as possible. And how do you then um, deal with those conflicts or, or controversies in, in, in teamwork? Thank you so much for that. So since we are 10 minutes till the end of the, I think we would have a lot to talk about over here, but I'd like to pass on to the next slide, if you could go there as well. The second part here would be to identify, so it's the other side of the coin of the first slide. Uh, in your perspective, on your practice, on your approach to TD, what are the practices that you identify that can enhance equitable collaboration? So what were uh, the solutions that you, would, you were able to find out about when you're trying to tackle and deal with the challenges that we just um, recognized in the first slide about funding mechanisms, expectations, different perspectives, different languages? Yeah, a humble attitude towards other ways of knowledge, considering those are also science. So this is a really interesting solution. Does the person that put up that one wants to comment on it? Uh, 
I added that sticky note, Laila. That just because uh, sometimes, or I see, uh, especially well, from different societal actors, sometimes it's difficult to acknowledge that other ways of knowledge or, or being in the earth are not science or are science, because it seems like this morning I was just listening to another um, in another session here, like they were also in, in the African context, also asking why there is so difficult to uh, work towards transdisciplinary. Is that because only one from one discipline perspective or one person want to shine a lot or something like that? So it's, if that's why I think it's important to start with the attitude as well towards uh, building these relationships with other other people. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fanny. And I think this echoes a lot of what people are trying to, to recognize here, how key communication, facilitation, and exercises that really reveal those unconscious biases and uh, recognize uh, the underlying power structures, differences in languages, because uh, those challenges are there when the TD project begins, uh, but they are not clear to everyone. It's not possible to have everything clear uh, to all engaged stakeholders before uh, the ongoing process actually starts. So I think it really does echo a lot of uh, has been uh, doing here. So to be a, a bit more specific, does the person that uh, mentioned the team exercise want to uh, share an experience or something that popped to their minds when writing this? No, it's okay to feel shy, not a problem. Uh, what about the person that brought up the idea of having best communication practices and games, role playing, the rolling to break down tensions, working? Because it's really similar to, to the idea of team exercise. <laughs> Does this person want to share? That's me again. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel like I've, I've, I've been talking a lot, but yes, it does. Um, uh, really touch on a lot of what has been said around communication and facilitating. So those are just examples of some of the things to try and break down, um, you know, those tensions, inequalities and, and, and so forth. But the building trust and relationships, I guess, is like a long term uh, kind of strategy, which eventually will then would then work in the long run. Thank you. No. So it's about generating an environment for joint learning and training experiences to develop uh, skills, translation, interpretation. So I think uh, it, it's really striking to see how the, 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 this group of people here together to talk about TD recognizes the importance of think about uh, methodologies and, uh, in, well, I, I use the word methodology here, not in the scientific way, methodology in, in the, the general idea of how to do it, right? So develop ways, uh, paths and uh, tools that we can use to, uh, rec to create an environment where TD is possible, right? So, uh, it's not possible to go for a TD project without at least tackling the issue of how we are going to do it, right? So it's really different from unusual science project in that sense, because you have to also think about how you are going to relate this that with these diverse sets of knowledges. And I think uh, what uh, the project showed case here, uh, really do provide lots of insights of uh, tools and ideas that were used to tackle that issue. 
So uh, since we are four minutes to the end, uh, uh, I'd like to open the floor to the participants uh, that uh, put up the, the sticky notes in general, if they want to comment a little bit further before we close. Anyone? Or maybe the speakers? Or insights? Huh? Or maybe someone from the panel. I just wanted to make a comment that I think that this community is a fantastic sort of starting place to identify tools, best practices to do this work that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time we do a TD project. Although of course there are, you know, local context has to be considered, but you know, fields like team science and transdisciplinary scholars are identifying ways to do this. And if we can incorporate this in a sort of in a purposeful way from the beginning of the research and the research design process, then we don't have to kind of come back to it later as like an afterthought, like something we need to add to the project or add to the budget. You know, this should be a part of the explicit design of how to do this together from, from day one. Yes, Anna, I completely agree. I think uh, there are many practices out there, but since it's a, a, a new idea with a growing body of people doing it, uh, it's really important that these spaces create uh, this connection. So, uh, well, well, just while listening to you, I was thinking about, well, the idea of creating the game that Sara mentioned. And so how can I uh, use all those experiences that were shared in future projects uh, of applying TD research and not reinventing the, the, the wheel <laughs> again and again? So that's a perfect comment for ending. Uh, so we are one minute to the end. I think we uh, try to squeeze as much juice as we could from our time together. And I'm really, really thankful for all your participation, our wonderful panelists, also the participants. Thank you so much for attending and keeping with us till the end. And uh, I, ju I just like to, to promote that the IAI has a, a, an initiative that's called the TD Academy. Uh, I'm going just to uh, put there in the chat box if you want to take a look because there are also their experiences about applying and doing TD research that might be of interest. And uh, follow us uh, uh, and subscribe to our newsletter to learn more and accompany our work on TD. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>